know until you, until you know at least the real consensus is where it starts. Exactly. And um, I'm a career science major student, and I have an endurance in community competition, which is related to data mining, and also technical competitions like the hardware competition, which is related to integration. Uh, my research research is mainly focused on machine learning, graph analytics, and data mining. And um, I'm a cat lover, a travel lover, and a Twitter. Actually, I have attended like over 40 or 60 uh, nationwide debate competitions. So I'm not saying that I'm good at communication, but I, I'm sure I have rich experience and you can lots of during communications and discussions. So I know during this course, you will have uh, lots of discussions uh, uh, to, to, to discuss with your teammates. So if you find similar problems during this course, uh, I'm happy to help and hope you enjoy this course. Cool. And then uh, somebody who's not with us today is a woman named Sarai. Um, so she's a project manager for uh, this class. This one's relatively small, so we just have one project manager. Um, the way this class works, right, is that we're doing projects for third parties, right? As a result, we need somebody who's going to kind of help coordinate with the third party. Uh, you know, some classes that are similarly designed at other universities actually have that be a member of the class. But we find that it's, um, it's easier if kind of most of the people in this class are kind of the same type of people or want to be the same type of people and but introducing like project managers introducing like a you know a, a ux designer introducing a, a back-end uh, database developer you know things like that are less likely to be a good way to kind of have a, a cluster of class so we actually bring in this project manager from the outside it's another student she might be a graduate student i can't remember um looks like undergrad so but the idea is that she will help coordinate your team with the client, okay? So trying to get meetings scheduled is, as I'm sure you are used to, is always a bear, particularly when um, you know, you're working across organizations. So that's a big part of it. Um, and then it's also communicating with both the client and with the rest of the Spark staff, kind of how the project is doing. So it's very, very important that you keep her updated um, as we go. You'll meet her once we assign projects. Uh, and so we'll talk about that in a few minutes, kind of about the like order of the course. Okay? All right, so uh, mechanics and contacts, you all know where it is. That's good. It's the same place every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, generally speaking, and I'll talk about this, actually, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and then we have kind of office locations. Uh, for the first couple weeks, um, given Omicron and all that jazz, we're kind of suggesting, but not necessarily requiring. If you want to come to office hours, maybe do it virtually. Um, you know, so you know, just ping whoever you want to see, uh, and we'll set up a Zoom meeting and, and do it that way. But then we'll have, uh, but we'll also be there physically. So I will be in my office during my office hours, but feel free to set it up virtually, and I'll just do the call from there, or uh, you know, come by my office. Um, Shu is going to be pretty much entirely virtual for the first couple of weeks. If you really need to meet him in person, we can make that happen, but that's kind of where it is. Um, and then Sarah doesn't have office hours. She will instead be meeting you in the team meetings every time you have a team meeting. Um, but again, we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, let's see what else. Uh, yeah, does that make sense so far? All right. Okay, so. Uh, I feel like maybe I should do the introductions after this slide. I don't know. I get a little, you know, how many times I give this, it kind of changes around how I want to talk about it. Um, okay, so I mentioned already, what we're trying to do is these projects, right? But what you're actually meant to learn in this class, okay, is really about how to do a project. The expectation is that you have already learned a fair amount of kind of machine learning or data science, uh, you know, maybe some level of development. Um, you know, at least enough to get you through the machine learning stuff. Um, so that's kind of expected as a core requirement. And one of the things that we do for this class uh, is we actually have an assignment that we'll release hopefully tonight that'll be due in about two weeks. That is hopefully not that difficult, but if you don't pass it, you basically just pass fail. If you don't pass it, you cannot pass this course. So basically it's to give you a sense of are you prepared for this class? Because if you're not, we don't want you to find out at midterm time 
that oh my god this is like i do not have enough background in whatever to be able to like successfully complete this class so we're trying to give you a sense of maybe you know it, it is perfectly simple right like i said oh, maybe i should take another machine learning course or two before attempting this practical class um and so that's the idea behind it does that make sense all right we'll talk about that a little bit more too um and who's to take this course um this is where i think it's a little unusual okay so in the software engineering world uh we used to refer to people who are kind of like you um, as uh, quants or quantitative analysis um, and basically they were largely mathematicians uh you know or maybe statisticians or maybe both uh who would provide kind of software engineers a way to approach or calculate profits right this is primarily before machine learning really became a hot thing you know but i worked on neural networks in 1997 so it all has been around for a while. It's just, it didn't really explode until the last few years. Okay. So before that, we had what we refer to as quants. Um, and if you didn't know this already, software engineers are ridiculously lazy. Um, part of what is the drive behind software engineering is, you know, my old joke is like software engineering is all about putting yourself out of a job, right? Because if you can automate everything, what do we need you for, right? So everything gets shortened. Uh, so it's really important to try to keep track of this is the short name and what the actual meaning is. Um, I try not to use any of that lingo or jargon without explaining it. But if you hear me say one, please ask um, because I forget, right? Uh, so let's see. So who's take this course? The idea is that I want to expose you to doing machine learning actually in the real world where you're not just a quant right you're incorporating software engineering skills so we're going to go through things like okay great i got this model that runs on my laptop but that's not helping anybody right what i need to do is i need to put that into production somehow i need to make it so that when changes happen it gets updated when there's new data it gets updated uh you know it does periodic recalculations it continues to learn from itself all these things are usually referred to as like a deployment Okay, so we'll actually be doing that whole thing, and then kind of in the middle of it, we'll also be doing the actual machine learning component. Does that make sense? So what we're looking for is what I'm trying to help you to become is what I think of as the kind of much more useful data engineer in a software development firm or you know a general firm, which is one who is at least aware of all of the activities in the software engineering side of making a machine learning thing work. You may not ever do it in, you know, as a job or whatever, but if you're aware of it, then you'll, it'll make a lot more sense why, you know, an engineer is telling you, oh, I gotta do this, this, and this. And you go, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, I need to change my model this way to make it work that, but work better for that scenario. So we're trying to introduce you to that so that you can kind of be a little bit more well-rounded, okay? Um, okay, as far as attendance is concerned, um, technically, I think it says in the syllabus that you can have three absences. This class, however, it's better if you come, and there's a couple reasons. One, for the lectures, uh, if you're not here, then uh, that means I will get bored because there will be less discussion or answering questions or whatever, um, as well as you also do get something out of somebody asking a question and hearing the answer, right? You may have that question. That said, I do try to record all the lectures so that you can go back and reference them. Um, and I'll release them usually about two weeks after I do it. Um, but sometimes technology fails. For example, when we did the very beginning of this introduction, I forgot to actually turn on the mic. So, uh, you know, I'm doing it all very manually. So as a result, there can be errors. So you may miss it. So I do encourage you to come to class. Some of the classes, um, have you all looked at the syllabus yet? All right, so it might be worthwhile to break out a computer and open up the syllabus, and then we can kind of talk about some of the bits and pieces. Um, so let me just make sure it is somewhere easy to find. Um, you should have all gotten like a welcome email that told you about Piazza and Gradescope and all that jazz. Um, 
And the syllabus is attached in Piazza. So if you go to Piazza and then you go to the class, right, and you go to resources, and at the top of that, there's a syllabus download link. It is important to be familiar with Piazza because this is generally speaking kind of how we release homework for assignments, um, as well as kind of general communication within the class. Uh, so if you notice below where the syllabus is, you'll see that it's homework. Are, yeah. In Piazza, uh, you might have to sign in with the, uh, the link that like the, what do we call it? There's like an access code, that's it. Um, that should have been in the email. Okay, did anybody get the email? You said you didn't get yours either. I just thought, thought it was like failing. Okay, uh, I don't know why the email didn't go out. Um, let's see. Well, that's annoying. Uh, let me do this. All right, I can't do much about the size, obviously, of the URL, but can you read the URL? But basically, it says, Uh, let's see. Uh, so your normal BU, uh, you know, piazza.com slash BU, um, spring 2022, DSCS 549. Okay, so if you go there, give everybody a second to get there. Yeah. Right, so when you get the access code, hold on a second, I'll play the access code. All right. Some of you may just drop in, some of you may need the access code. It's a little odd how it sets it up. So let's see, what is the access code? Uh, the access code, actually, I can show you, I think. How am I not logged in? Oh, sorry, give me one second. Well, this is going swimmingly. All right, here is the access code. Can you all read that from the back? Is that big enough? I can make it bigger. There you go, that's ridiculously big. Good. All right, so try and get to the syllabus once you get there. Then let's do another uh, using the computer as a group exercise and get you all into grade scope and make sure that works too. In the syllabus, I don't know, maybe three quarters of the way down, just do a fine for grade scope. There should be a uh, link to the grade scope. Yeah. It's so you go to resources, which <laughs> it's kind of buried in the top. I think it's a really weird design, personally. So yeah, it's right here on resources. All right, everybody got syllabus now? All right, cool. All right, so like I said, it's like three quarters way down. Um, I think I had it open, yes. Uh, Up there. Okay, looks like three million five. Uh, this link should be live for you. So I can't. I'm not Really? All right. I will 
say in my defense, I have never had these problems before. <laughs> I've always had the email go out. I always had to read set up correctly. Uh, let's just see. Ah, let's see if this is. All right, looks like I need to do an, like another sync with Blackboard. Uh, it's cooking right now. Uh, what was your name again? Yeah, I got you. Uh, yeah, you should be there now. Like everybody should be there. So now if you click on it, it should work. Okay, cool. All right. Let's see, how much more paint can we have? Uh, and you all can see the blackboard, right? All right, cool. I love software. Um, this is the joke of a single sign-on. Uh, so let's see, where were we? Um, so yeah, so if, if you don't think you're gonna be able to come to class for whatever reason, um, less true for right now, my other practical class is at like 5 p.m. So I would often have students have to miss it because they like had an internship interview or something. Um, you know, so if you have a good reason, you know, just let me know. We'll, uh, you know, we'll try to work it out. The, oh, so the other part of the class, if we go kind of, if I'm an out, um, down in the course schedule here, you'll see some of the uh, like schedule is these uh, lab work sessions, okay? So where that is, is basically, it, it may be related to something we're talking about, but often it won't necessarily. But basically what it is, is it's time, it's time in class for you to work as a team. And for me and, uh, uh, you know, and Sue to come around and kind of be like, How's it going? You know, what problems are you having? What are you talking about? Uh, so if you're missing from that, it's obviously also bad. Um, the other thing is there's two presentations. Um, so one is the midterm presentations right before spring break. Okay. And then the other one is basically the final presentation, which well, we'll play it a little by ear, but I think this class is small enough that we can fit it all in one lecture. Um, but it's on the third. Uh, it is very important to be here for that. And the reason is because I expect everybody to present on the team. So, you know, we have six slides, two person team, three people do this, one person does three, one person does three, something like that. So, really important to be here for those. Um, you can make it up if you obviously, you know, if you have some massive conflict. Uh, but it's really hard. Uh, so please try to be there for those. Um, the other thing that hasn't been announced yet is uh, we also do at the end of all these practice classes, we have what's called Demo Day. And Demo Day is where we invite all of the partners across all of the practice classes. Um, and as well as anybody else who wants to come. And when we have a virtual component, we actually get a fair number of attendees. And then basically, the winning presentation will present at that demo day. That demo day is not scheduled yet, but it's almost always basically the, the last day of classes or leading into the first day of what is called reading period, like the period before finals. Um, so right around there. So if possible, try to be free for that. It is not strictly mandated, but it's good that you can come because it's kind of cool to be able to see everybody else's projects, everything else that we've been doing. And then if you are the, are the winning team, you can present with your with your team. Okay. So I think those are the big highlights. Uh, one other thing I want to point out too, um, as I know there's often not a lot of native or you know a lot of non-native English speakers. Um, as software development and stuff in general in the world tends to be in English. I do grade for grammar and spelling, okay? And if your grammar and spelling is not that good in English, there are a ton of tools to help you. Grammarly, for example, use them, okay? The thing I do actually is I never send anything important without having somebody else read it first, okay? That somebody might be a classmate, but it might just as easily be my wife, right? Like we, you know, just find somebody who you can sucker into reading it you know, and give them a bag of donuts or something and trade. All right. So 
you can, there's lots of ways to go about solving this problem without actually being the best writer in the world. I'm a pretty good writer and I still do it. Okay. Although technically speaking, English is actually not my first language either. So um, does that make sense to everybody? But that's why I grade for it because first of all, it annoys me. Second of all, because so much software engineering in the world is in English. All right, time check. All right, so um, let me talk a little bit about kind of assignments. Um, there's no exams per se in this class, okay? There are just assignments. So there's this first one, which I was saying is, you know, it's weird and super ugly. You have about two weeks to do it. Uh, the expectation is that you get it done, right? Uh, there's also office hours if you're totally stuck. Okay, so come and talk to us and we'll advise you on you're totally stuck because you need to learn this entire thing of knowledge. Or, you know, you are stuck because we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have a typo in the, in the thing, right? Feel free to ask that kind of question on Piazza. Ask, you know, come to office hours. We, I want you to continue in the course. Okay, so I really want as many people as we can have get into the course. But I also don't want you to have to withdraw it before like bailing out of the class, right? So it really is just to try to help you make sure you're comfortable with the class. And and I have had students in the past where they were not doing that well in the assessment, but they were like, I promise I will, you know, do all these things and it will be, you know, and I'll be ready by the time I need to be. And we agreed that that was okay. And they did. And they came out with a pretty good grade. Okay. Um, let's see. So assignments. Um, okay, so the assignments will, so basically everything will be announced in Piazza, but then it's going to kind of direct you somewhere else to actually do the thing, whatever it is. Okay. So the, uh, you know, usually grade scope with, with any luck. It's a lot easier for me to use grade scope, but sometimes the grade scope just can't do what I want it to do. So generally it will be grade scope, but not always. So Piazza is kind of your last arbiter. Um, also related to assignments, uh, this is where I have to keep the track of which class I'm teaching you at what time. Um, the assignment due dates are not at present in the schedule. However, as soon as I can, probably by the end of next week, I will be updating the syllabus to show you when the assignments are expected to be done. Okay, so that you'll know when they are. Basically, I wasn't confident that I liked everything that I, that I had for assignments. So I wanted to kind of back off a little bit and give it a little bit of time to get ready and make sure that we had assignments that made sense. Following. So the thing about the syllabus, it does change. I will almost always mention it in the class, but don't just keep your memory of, oh, assignment was due on blah, blah, blah. Look at Piazza, which will be the, that'll be the final word. Um, you know, look at the syllabus again, that course schedule. One of these days I gotta get a website written so that you can have, like I can just have a dynamic website that'd be a lot easier to read, but I haven't done that yet. So, uh, let me just tell you how much it was terrible. I had COVID over Christmas, killed my productivity for like a week and a half. So there are a bunch of things I wanted to get done that didn't get done as nicely as I wanted. Um, okay, grading. So I wanna point out in the grading uh, that there is, uh, you know, so the assignments are, are important, right? They're about 15%. Attendance and participation, about 5%. Uh, peer evaluations, which I haven't really mentioned yet. At the end of the semester, we're going to ask you to rate everybody else on your team, okay? Including yourself. So we're going to give you some arbitrary number like 500, and you're going to say, I allocate 250 points, or uh, let's say, let's make it cleaner than that. I allocate you know, 100 points to this person, I allocate 300 points to that person, and I allocate 200 points to, to myself. Um, the idea is that will be incorporated into your grade, is how your peers are evaluated. Is one, another thing that I think is very, very important about software engineering is it's a team, okay? As much as you sometimes are annoyed by it, especially when you have to carry somebody on the team, it's a team. You will not be successful without the team. The other thing I really want to point out is one of the ridiculously horrible problems we have in the software engineering world 
is most of them look like me, which means that they have a very limited perspective. So ensure that when you're working as a team, that you're listening to all the teammates. Because somebody coming from a different background, coming from a different gender or race or socioeconomic status or whatever, will have a different viewpoint. Okay, my classic example of this is, you know what facial recognition is really good at recognizing? White men. You know what's really bad at recognizing? Everything else. Okay? The reason is, or I mean, I'm sure there's lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is, is because what they were feeding it to train it was pictures of white men because the people working on it had a lot of pictures of white men because they were them, right? So it's very, very important to keep that in mind. Another thing we'll be covering in this class is uh, we'll have uh, actually guest lecture come in and talk about ethics, uh, you know, particularly challenging in this field where you have a lot of power that's inside a black box, right? So the facial recognition is a great example. Your average policeman doesn't understand where that facial recognition is breaking down. And so as a result, it's just going to trust the black box. As a result, some of the ethical responsibility of making sure the policeman does the right thing is pushed onto you as the designer of the black box. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? All right. Uh, let's see. So peer evaluation. There's a long-winded way of saying everybody rates each other. Um, then there's the midterm presentation, and then the final presentation. Okay, but the bulk of the uh, the bulk of your score is the project itself. Now, again, it's a team, so your project score will be a team score. Wonderful. Um, where? So, so, can I read this by the way? So I meant to ask. I forgot. Okay. Um, so. Really obvious things, right? Stability, you know, does it stop right? Um, mathematical soundness, so this is kind of like the brass tacks. Does it does it actually make sense? Um, functionality, does it do what you promised it would do? Okay. And let's be very clear here, there's a big difference between what it could do and what you promised it would do. Okay. We'll talk about it, you know, a little bit later in the lecture today. Under promise over deliver. Okay. Figure out what you want it to do or what you what you think you can make it do, not what you hope it will do. Okay? And that's what you want to commit to. Uh, code quality organization, this is the thing that's very important to me. I will look at the code, I will look at how easy it will be for some future team in this same class to pick up your work and add to it. Okay, that's why code quality organization matters. As well as what there's this old joke about um, Perl. Does so everybody know the programming language Perl? Okay, so Perl, Perl forever, really, really good at making expressions, is actually uh, not uncommonly used in kind of data cleanup type activity. But it's, uh, you all know Java though, right? And you've heard uh, write once run everywhere about Java. Like you can write it on Linux and it'll run on Windows, which was its claim to fame back in the day. It became known as write once debug everywhere, um, but Perl is write once, period. Like you can't ever go back and edit it because you don't know what to do. It's just too confusing. Uh, two weeks after you work about it, it's ridiculously complicated. Uh, that's why code quality, etc., matters because three months from now, six months from now, assuming you are working in some sort of engineering firm, you're going to have to fix a bug. And you want to know how to do it, right? And you will not remember how the code works unless you've been continuously working on that exact same thing the whole time. Um, and then, last thing, this is where it might split trade across the different people. This is workflow. So, are you attending regular meetings? Um, you know, are you communicating? And this is another thing we'll talk about a little bit in a future lecture. But you need to communicate with your PMs. You need to communicate with your teammates. You know, there should not be an email or a Slack message that lies around for, you know, too long uh, without you respond. Okay. Email, usually 24 hours. Slack, usually six to eight. Okay. Again, this is actually a little one of those places where it's like under promise over deliver in the sense that. 
set a team expectation for how fast communication will be, and then just meet or exceed that, right? Then you don't have to worry about, are you doing it fast enough? So but these are the kinds of things that you can do as a team and you can decide on. But if you just pretend everyone is gonna know, just know what the right answer is, you're gonna find out the hard way that you were wrong, right? And everybody has different expectations coming in. All right. Uh, there is no actual textbook in this class. There's a bunch of readings. They, I think, are all linked to in the syllabus. But again, keep an eye on Piazza um, just for a final word. Um, but I think they're all there. It's not a ton. Um, it's, and it tends to favor the stuff I expect you not to know as well, which is the kind of the software engineering side or, or the practice of software engineering. But not entirely. Um, oh, and then the last thing that I think is really important to mention, disability accommodations. If there is something that is aiding you from, you know, participating fully in this class, please, please, please let me know. Or if it's something you don't think I can help with, contact the disability office, okay? Most of you have been, you know, most of you are not freshmen, so you probably have this experience already if you've had to deal with something like this. Um, but if not, or if there's something special about this class that's a problem, please let me know. Like I said before, I want you to get a good grade in this class. I want you to do really well. I want to make more people who are good at this stuff. Okay? Let's see. And then, like I said, course schedule. Um, you know, do, do know, you probably are used to this, but, you know, we, we do have a, you know, a Tuesday that's pretending to be a Monday, so we don't have a class. We obviously have spring break. We have, I think we have one other weird one. Um, so just, you know, keep those in mind. I don't want you showing up here with nobody else here. Um, but you can be sure the room's empty. So there's that. Well, oh, maybe. Um, any questions so far? All right. So just keep in mind, you know, the syllabus as much as possible is a contract between us, okay? So you should be aware of your side of the contract, right? All right, going back to my awesome slides. Um, they get more fun in a second, I think. I think, oh, collaboration. So watch for the announcement for the assignment, whether collaboration is expected or not, okay? Some of them are, some of them aren't. So this first assignment, for example, as might be obvious, you are not expected to collaborate on it with anybody else. You should be doing it on your own because we're trying to assess your ability to tolerate this class. The project, on the other hand, you better be collaborating, right? So kind of depends on their work. Just kind of keep it in mind. Um, oh, sorry, I missed uh, pitch day. So, the reason you're not meeting the PM today is because what will happen on the 1st of February, which is what, three, four lectures from now? Uh, yeah, so they're not next week, but the week after, um, is what we call pitch day in Spark, which is where the partners, the clients will actually, we're gonna do it over Zoom, but they'll come to the class and pitch their project to you. And then you will tell us your preferred project to work on. And then we're going to try to match you to your to your highest ranked choice. Okay, we won't necessarily entirely be able to do so, but we do try. That way, we can hopefully get you involved in a project that is, uh, you know, something you're interested in working on. Um, and so we we usually, although I don't know if we have it this time, but we usually have more projects than we'll actually deliver on. So that we can, you know, if one, if one everybody agrees that one sounds super boring, it just doesn't get picked. Okay. And we usually refer to that as pitch day. Uh, we'll have support from the PM for that. And then the, the PM boss is a woman named Greta. Um, and then we also have, so kind of from an instructional resource perspective, we have Shu, we also have the PM, but then we have another Spark staff member whose name is Michelle Vong who is a professional data scientist, okay? So if you have really hard questions that uh, we don't feel comfortable answering, 
uh, then we're going to point that we're going to bring her in, right? Or we're going to ask her for you know consultation or whatever. Um, you can reach out to her directly if you like. Um, however, she tends to be very busy, so it's often better to kind of go through one of us or your PM uh, to try to get time with her to talk about some problem that you're having. Um, but she's done real world data science in a professional capacity. I mean, or I, I guess I would say it's she still does real world data science in a professional capacity. I've done a lot of software in a professional capacity for a long time, but technically that's not what I do anymore. Um, all right, questions? Good. All right. So, oops. And so that assignment will be due on pitch day, basically, so that we can kind of align everything up. Um, okay, so now here's the lecture part of the lecture versus the intro to the class part of the lecture. Um, and so, what we're going to talk about is software development methodologies. Okay, and the reason we talk about them is because there's two big competing styles. One is called waterfall, and one is called agile. We're going to talk about them both in a few minutes. Um, but does anybody have an idea about like why do we have these project management methodologies? What 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 do you think they're for? Assuming you all know what the word methodology is. Any ideas? Okay, and why, why do you care? Like, why, why is that a good thing? Right. Okay. Uh, any other ideas? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So both those two things are, are very good examples, right? One is kind of for planning purposes, so you know where you're supposed to be at any given point, you know whether the process is going to be late, right? But then the other thing is also predictability, so you can say, oh, we did a project kind of like this two years ago, um, that, that can inform this current process, right? So if we use well-structured methodologies, then we can do those two things. Any other ideas about why they might be useful? Expectation setting. So, um, if we all agree on a development methodology, then, and let's say we're one big software team of some kind, then I can express things to you that you understand what I mean. Okay. One of the things that I wish they taught here, which they don't seem to, and it's kind of falling out of favor in the software world in general, is this concept called patterns, which is basically the idea is that if we label a thing, that describes how to approach a problem, then I can just give you the label and you'll know what I mean, right? Instead of use instead of the typical problem with English, which is it's very loosey-goosey, right? This is uh, one of the common issues that we have with um, American software engineers working with Indian software engineers. Culturally, the a yes or a head nod in English means I agree with you, I will do this. Okay, or I'm sorry, in American English. In India, yes, you often means, not always, but often means I understand you. Not that I agree, not that I'm committed, just that I understand. Okay, so you can imagine that if I say to you as an Indian developer, right, um, when you do ABC by Wednesday, and they say yes, I'm going to expect it by Wednesday. But what they mean is, I understand that you want this by Wednesday. So you have to be really careful about how you phrase exactly what you want to ask for when you're talking across cultures. As a result, we use techniques like project management methods to try, try, it's not perfect by any sense of imagination, but try to even out some of those cultural differences between different people on the team. Okay? And neither, to be clear, right, neither one's wrong, right? They just aren't saying the same thing. <sighs> okay, so I always really like this. Um, and there's a pop culture section at the end. Um, but XKCD, if you're not reading it already, uh, you can't claim yourself as a, as a true nerd. Um, 
there's a lot of misses, but there's a lot of really good ones. Uh, so this one's particularly funny because we refer to the software world, a lot of people refer to themselves as software engineers. Okay. Engineers actually build things that like have to stay upright, like this building. Okay. Software, meh, right? It's not it's not literally holding anything up, usually. It has a lot of implications, but it fails. But this example is a great one. There was a big push for electronic voting over the past couple of years in the US. Uh, <coughs> under, excuse me, under the auspices of COVID, but also uh, largely as a mechanism to keep people out of the vote. Um, but long story short, you know, do you really want to trust the software person? How many bugs have you all written, right? I've written billions probably by now. Do you really want to trust them to build your voting mechanism? And then on top of that, you know, and of course you have to incorporate whatever the latest buzzword is, in this case, blockchain. And so therefore it must be better, right? Because now it has a buzzword. Don't get me wrong. I think some of the blockchain stuff actually for the software engineering version is back when I gave a lecture about blockchain and NFTs and why they're interested. Um, like, but people don't know what they're talking about. They just use the buzzword and they're like, blockchain makes it better. Right? Hopefully, all of you at least have some idea of what a blockchain is. Um, if you don't, you should check it out. It's really cool. <laughs> but also massively misused. Sorry, when I do all this talking, it makes me talk. <sighs> all right, so back to software methodologies. We have Waterfall and Agile, um, and there's pros and cons to both approaches. Okay? Um, and I feel like all slide decks need more cats, so that's why you get cat pictures. Uh, there is some loose relevance. That looks like an Agile cat. <coughs> and there's a cat in Waterfall. Uh, okay, so the waterfall model, this is the more traditional development model. It is getting increasingly unused. However, the first two points about why we should have a constant methodology at all actually are much better done with the waterfall method. Okay, the reason is, is because as you can see, I mean, why is it called waterfall? It looks like a waterfall, right? You go from one stage to the next stage and you keep falling down. But at the beginning, what you do is you gather all the requirements, okay? Then you build a design, then you implement it, then you test it, and then you release it, okay? And then you have a maintenance cycle, you know, for bugs, etc. <clears throat> That's very logical, right? Any idea of what might be wrong with this? Why is this falling out of favor? <clears throat> when for planning and predictability, it looks great, right? You know exactly how long you're going to spend on requirements. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I just talked less. So you know exactly how much time you're going to spend on requirements. You can take those requirements and build a design from it. From the design, you can calculate how long it'll take you to build the actual software. So why might this be falling out of favor? Any theories? So I would remove the word might and completely agree with you. In other words, usually in here, and sometimes in, in especially big waterfall projects, here you found out you built the wrong thing. Because as I was going back to or kind of alluding to earlier, that requirements gathering phase has two problems. One, English, okay? So basically, you know, client, you know, customer is saying something. And you're hearing something else. Okay. So that's one problem. The other problem is that this is not zero time over this. So the requirements change, right? Things things evolve. All of a sudden we can't go outside and we can't, you know, go to the mall anymore. So that mall software is not going to be a good idea with both. Right? It's going to work differently to attract business, you know, attract customers. Um, and it's actually funny. I was talking to an owner of a liquor store recently who's been seriously working on their new website because they built their whole business model was wrapped around being social, like people coming into the shop, doing wine tastings and things like that. 
But with COVID, nobody wants to come into the place, and they don't really want people to come into the place. So they want to move their, their application towards mobile ordering, but they don't want to lose their claim to fame, which is that social aspect. So how do they do that? But assuming that you went, you know, whatever, started your project in October of 2019, with a planned delivery in March of 2020, uh, 2020 no, 2019, sorry, I don't know, whatever, beginning of COVID, um, you're in trouble. You just spent a whole bunch of money in time building something that's working. So because of that, um, there's actually, and there's another big reason too. Another big reason is that when you're building a building, okay, if you think about the, the kind of the biggest part of it first and then kind of fill in the details, that makes sense. And so people apply that to doing software when in fact software works much better if you actually go from kind of the ground up. So if you do the details first and let the kind of overall building evolve, uh, that actually tends to work better because you can see what's actually used Things like that. So, like, if you were going to design a building, but didn't have to worry about the cost of actually creating things, and let's say it was something like a library, which a library has, you know, a lot of mixed-use modes, right? Might have study areas, might have little lecture halls, it might have, you know, it has books, it has, um, you know, meeting rooms, etc. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be a lot better to basically start it out in the field? Right, and then seeing how many people are giving talks versus how many people are reading books versus how many people are collaborating together, and then build spaces for each of those, right? And then as more conference rooms are needed, you build more conference rooms. Yeah, of course, in some you know mystical world, that might be a better way to build buildings, but we physically can't do that. But we can with software. And so as a result, agile methods have really started to take over. So um I think this one's funny because Agile, as a methodology, is actually all of these different methodologies. Okay, there's this one called 40, but I think somebody, like somebody who's a specialist in this stuff, told me there's actually a hundred of them out there now. However, most people only know of two. One is called Scrum, and one is called Kanban. Okay, do these words do sound familiar at all? Okay, so both of them. Actually, I don't know if I, I don't know if that's a great example, but uh, if you aren't familiar with it, I should put a picture in. Uh, so they actually started out primarily as physical things. See if we can get a good picture here. We'll wait for it to load, whichever. Um, let's look at this one. I'm starting to hate the internet, I think. You know, web, point, uh, web 1.0 is a lot more fun. It's a lot easier to use. All right, so, so this is kind of your typical idea of what both Scrum and Kanban use for what are called the boards, right? Or the work board. They have a lot of different names. Um, but this is the board. They were, they used to be primarily required to be done in person uh, because they mostly came out of startups, and there's a lot of value to in-personness when you have a really small team. Um, because what happens with a really small team is people wear lots of different hats. Okay. And if you are in the same physical proximity, it's much easier to tell I'm wearing this hat today and you're wearing that hat today. It's much harder to do remotely. It is getting increasingly possible, but it's still hard. So <clears throat> the origin of this stuff happened to be in person, but there's tons of tools out there now that do this all digitally. Okay. A really common one is Trello. Another really common one, or actually, so Jira was actually a much more traditional waterfall based piece of software, but now actually supports Kanban boards as well. So even though the method is called Scrum and Kanban, both of them usually use what are called Kanban boards. Okay. 
The big difference is, is that this to-do list over here, in Scrum, what you do is you say, I need to do these five items on the to-do list over the next two weeks, okay? And the two weeks is an arbitrary size for what's called a sprint, okay? And that two week sprint uh, will accomplish those five tasks. And those five tasks are for the whole team, okay? And maybe one person is gonna do two of them, and another person is gonna do one of them, and another one's gonna do the other two. Doesn't really matter because different cards have different sizes. That makes sense? So you collect all the five you want for that sprint, okay? And then you do that sprint. And then at the end of the sprint, you say, okay, let's look back on the sprint. What did we do right? What did we do wrong? Let's make some improvements. Um, the other big thing about the end of the sprint is that you release something. So in other words, you do what's usually referred to as a demo, okay? So the team, every single person on the team shows something that they accomplished during that two weeks preferably something that's in production okay so if it's a pre-release piece of software then it's your production environment that hasn't actually been released to the public yet but is live right um the big difference between that and kanban is just same card same kind of workload and that kind of stuff except instead of having that two-week split block the kanban just goes continuously and you just always take the highest level item on the to-do list that's not in progress that you think you can accomplish and do it. Doesn't really matter how long it'll take, doesn't really matter who it is or whatever. Um, you just kind of keep taking the next one whenever you get done with the last thing you did. Both of those methods, right, require you to never move anything from to-do to in progress until you're literally working on it. So in my previous example, where one person is going to pick up two of the items, they only move one of the items in progress, unless they're literally starting both of them at the same time. Okay, why do you think that might be? Why is it so important to leave it in to do until you literally start working? Come on, somebody has to have a guess. Crazy guess is totally fine. Exactly. So the biggest problem you have with a lot of teams like this is that if somebody says they're working on three of the items, when in fact they're only working on one of the items, and let's say two other people are free because they have no money with whatever they're working on. But now they're stuck. Right? Because it says it's in progress, they either have to go and communicate with the person who says they have it in progress, or you know, let's say they did do start a little bit of it, and then kind of, you know, whatever, they just kind of split up the work, whatever, and ended up focusing on one of them. Now you actually have to transition the work, which is even worse, right? To the other person. So it is a huge problem and very difficult from like at least for me, right? Like as a human, to not do. You know, I know I have to do these two tasks in this sprint, so I plop them both in the in progress, right? It's just like kind of automatic. So you really have to be careful not to do that. Um, and it, it, like I said, it can take some weird learning time. Um, so the last thing I'll say, a lot of the reasons, particularly you as students, might be more likely to refer to Scrum and not Kanban, is because Scrum, as you might imagine, tends to favor new work. Okay, so a new project, a new thing with new features, etc. Uh, whereas Kanban tends to favor maintenance projects. Okay, so for example, the IT help desk, I have no idea if they do, but could use a Kanban board, right? Next support call that came in, I pick it up and I start working on it. Doesn't really matter what it is, as long as it's roughly in my area, right? But we don't have to pre assign it, we don't have to waste time assigning things, we don't have to waste time figuring out how long everything will take. We just pick up the next one because we know the next one needs to be done. Um, and the, the biggest challenge with it is making sure it's having somebody or some set of somebody's ensure that the one at the top is actually the highest priority. Make sense? Because you don't want the you don't want the person who has to implement whatever it is to have to also go and figure out what the highest priority is. You just have to keep the highest priority at the top. 
All right. So, so as you can see here, we have Scrum there, and Kanban should be here somewhere. Um, yeah, there. Um, all right, two of the other really common ones that are kind of falling out of favor. One is called Lean. Does anybody know where that's come from? Where that comes from? Okay, I'll tell you another little story. So Toyota, you're making the, the car part of Toyota, uh, adopted a methodology quite some time ago now that they called Lean. And the idea, and this is where a lot of agile methods actually come from, is that anybody involved in the production of the car can stop the process at any time without negative repercussions. Okay? So that any person, somebody who's putting doors on a car, can decide to hit that button and stop all production while they try to figure out some problem. And basically, what it does is it allows for that assembly line to have a continuously, continuous feedback loop on what's working and what's not working from the people who are doing the work. Okay? So, as you might have imagined, uh, you know, a software development uh, project that's based on lean kind of works the same way. So basically, it's kind of like the Kanban that you're kind of picking up tasks or whatever. But at any time, anybody can say, hold on, let's pause for a minute, let's talk about this problem. Okay, and then kind of force feedback that. Uh, XP is another really common one. Um, there's other details about XP, but the big one that people remember is what's called pair programming. Does anybody know what pair programming is? All right, can you tell me? How about you? I saw you not first. Yeah, so I know how well I can hear you, but uh, what I think you were saying is like one person's typing, the other one's taxi driving, right? Um, it actually is, can be, and often is very effective on something that's hard um, and, and or something where uh, the, the expertise in whatever it is is kind of split amongst people. Um, it can be really, really useful. It is not in common too with like old friends of mine. You know, people I've worked with off and on, or you know, old friends, for me to want to work in a pair programming style on a particular thing, because I'll want to be like, hey, help me look at this because I know it's going to be complicated. I know I'm in this stuff, so please look at this while I'm doing it. A uh, common example would be um, like uh, threading. Threading is really easy to have race conditions and speak to the state all over the place. Having somebody else with you while you do it helps a lot. Some of these modeling problems also similar, okay? Where having somebody looking over your shoulder, pointing out where you have a stupid bug, helps a lot because they're sometimes really difficult to notice yourself when you're kind of in the in the thick of it, right? Typically with XP, all of the development is done that way. The reason it's not particularly popular is because it means you only get 50% of your work. The XP proponents argue that it's better work. Managers don't always agree, right? So uh, that's why it's not particularly popular. <clears throat> but I do actually strongly encourage it, you know, kind of in, in small pieces. It can be, like I said, very effective. Um, and then the vast majority of these I know nearly nothing about. Um, you know, it's kind of like I've heard of CSCM and FTP. Um, and we actually are going to talk about TDD. So TDD and DDD. Personally, you know, this, like I said, it's a funny picture. I didn't make it. I don't necessarily agree with the bibliography because you can do TDD with Scrum. All right. So TDD and DDD, which is related, TDD is what's called test driven development. Okay. The idea of this is that. Before you write any code, you write the tests that you're going to implement code to satisfy. Okay? So, have you all heard of unit tests? Okay, so it's unit test tests a unit of code, right? That's the idea. That's why it's called that. So, if you write the unit test first, you know, let's say you're doing an addition method. And so, you want to make sure that, you know, when you add four and five, you get nine. Okay, 
So you write the four plus five equals nine once I run it through the method first. Then you go write the intermediate. This does two things. One, it makes you think about all the edge cases first, okay, by trying to write tests for them all. Two, it doesn't, you don't implement anything more than you actually have to to meet the test. Okay, one of the temptations when you're writing a piece of like a method or something is to think of all the scenarios in which it can be used and then write the code for that. But that's not actually the goal a lot of the time. The goal is write the method to meet the needs of the software that's using it. So if you write the test first, then it will, you know, uh, then you'll only implement the stuff you need to implement. And then, you know, and then what I'll commonly do actually that in some of those scenarios is if I had a test or didn't have a test for a certain kind of scenario, and I know I didn't have a test, and I know I didn't care, I will actually put in the method an exception that says not implement. So if anybody ever calls it and tries to get that scenario, it will just tell them, I didn't implement this. Please feel free to do so. Right? So PDD is what's called business driven development. But it's kind of taking another step back. And this is what is you can write your requirements in a programming language. So if you wrote the requirement in a programming language, that is a test, essentially. So it's just like test driven development, except the language isn't Python, it's English. And there are certain styles that you use. Um, I can't think of a really common one. Um, but to kind of alter the, the requirements, and then you write the implementation just like you would with TDD. Right? But there's an actual compiler for the English that will result in tests and outcomes to the results. Um, it's really very cool and I think could be very effective, but it's not heavily adopted in the industry that I've seen, <clears throat> which is why I don't know it that well. Like I've done systems in it, um, but you know, like of the hundreds, you know, I've done two, you know, three maybe. Um, so All right, so the other big thing you need to do with a software engineering project, manage your expectations. Under promise or deliver. Always, always, always decide what you're going to do. Knock 10% off, tell whoever you're telling that that's what you're going to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, one of the things that's very difficult to learn and takes up quite a long time is how to estimate for yourself. Okay, most people believe they can do more in a given amount of time than they actually can. Okay, for a variety of reasons, perfectly good ones. But it takes a long time to learn the difference between your estimate and reality. All right, and actually, if you have a good project manager or a good like line manager or something like that, they'll actually get to know you well enough to know what calculation to attach to your estimates to make them true. Okay. I used to be really good at this for the engineers that worked for me, right? Like I was really good at saying that guy is going to do 50% of whatever he tells me. And that guy is actually going to do 140%. So I bet and I, and I'll, I'll actually use those in my, my secret estimates, right? Um, and managing perception. So same kind of thing is like, remember who you're talking to and what about and why, and you'll have a much better day. Right, so that you can make sure that the person you're speaking to, whether it's a teammate, whether it's a client, whether it's a professor, think about who you're talking to, how they're going to hear it, and try to speak to that. Okay, one of the common examples I have for this is um, you'll see a new person at a company, particularly in like the management or even senior management level, they'll come in and they'll have their way of reporting on status. Okay. And it might be the best one ever in the entire world. However, everyone else will be angry with them because it's not using the status reporting technique that the, team, like that the environment uses. Why does that matter if it's the best one in the entire world? Because you get very good at consuming information in the same way, right? So if I'm used to seeing a you know, spreadsheet that looks like this, and I see it every week for two years, I get really good at extracting that information very quickly. You introduce a new spreadsheet, you've just killed my productivity. 
that make sense? So this is what I mean by managing perception, managing expectations. Make sure you know who you're talking to and what about in advance and try to think about how they're going to consume the information that you're giving them. Uh, and then important pop culture references come up all the time in all aspects of software. If you haven't seen the movie Office Space, you should um, think about you know destroying printers. Uh, Greg Gary, Glenn Ross, uh, definitely on the not safe for work list a lot of the time. But there are references to that movie commonly in engineering. Um, and then SKCD, and I've been trying to come up with some other ones that are really important diehards, uh, but that's the old list I have so far. And then I always like to show my quote unquote attributions. So all the images I use, this is where they came from. Um, one thing I like to point out, which I forgot at the beginning, is software reuse, right? Um, open source. And we'll talk about open source in a lot more depth in a future lecture. But if you can't notice, because it's cut off at the bottom of the screen, my slides actually have a copyright notice. Let me know why that is. And my copyright notice actually says you can use this for any non commercial purpose as long as you mention that I, you know, with the origin. Okay, so it's not a copyright note saying go away. Okay. So why do I put this on here? What happens if I put nothing on? It? Can you use it? No. Copyright by default is to the owner. So the default is you cannot use it. If it does not say expressly that you can, the default is that the author owns it. So I try, and I'm not perfect by any stretch of imagination, but I try to drop a license into everything I produce that indicates what level of use I expect someone else to use it for. All right. And I would say there's nearly nothing that I think is of awesomeness quality or whatever that I say that they can't use it for anything. Um, because I am generally an open source junkie and think it's really, really important. Um, so, but the point being is that that is a common understanding is that if there is no copyright notice, then it is open, but it is the opposite. And like I said, well, we actually have a whole lecture about copyright. The reason I bring it up today <clears throat> is because when you're using other people's code, which you should be in this class, attribution is important. Okay. There's a block on it in the syllabus. Read it, make sure you understand it. And we'll talk more about it. Um, you know. Most likely, if you do something like that, I'm going to, you know, call you on the telephone, except not really, and say, hey, you did this wrong. You know, where's the attribution? Where, you know, whatever. I'm not going to say fail. Okay. But do keep it in mind. Other people's work is important to them, right? Just like it would be important to you. So don't use it without permission. All right. I think we are out of time.